I thought it might be quite interesting to try sort of sanding or machining down these multi-layer boards to see how many layers there are inside. I decided to sort of set this up on uh, my little TNT engraver. This is the basic setup. We've got the uh, potential victim down here. See, we need dust extraction to keep all the dust out of the, out of the way. So we've got um, sort of vacuum cleaner um, inlet here. But as well as that, you also need to, because you're sort of creating a cavity, you tend to get dust accumulated in the cavity. So I've also got this line here, which is actually an air pump. Blows air. This is actually a, a diaphragm pump, so instead of a continuous stream, it's sort of giving you bursts. So it's quite good at just blowing and dislodging dust out of the hole. So that, that keeps it quite nicely clear. And of course, we've got some, got the um, camera overhead. This is with the macro lens, and I'm, it's quite hard to get the camera really in close. So I'm just you're know, using um, shooting at high res resolution, then cropping out the um, the part of interest. I've got, also got a very bright LED light here. Now, a couple of reasons for making it having really bright lighting. One is that you want to keep the aperture nice and small to get a good depth of field. Otherwise, um, as you sort of dig, as you drill further down, it's going to go out of focus. This is set up pretty much on the minimum aperture, so I don't have to worry too much about focusing. Also, it means it's less vari less sensitive to variations in ambient light. So, yeah, if I'm right, yeah, this this thing could easily run for over an hour. And if there's that, yeah, if there's daylight, that's going to increase and decrease. Or in some cases, I might want to leave it going and I sort of turn the lights out and. Um, let it go and by having a sort of very bright local light then it just doesn't really paint you know, ambient lighting just doesn't make any um any difference also you know if you're walking past it you're not going to cast a shadow over it or anything and the camera trigger is just um there's a two and a half mil plug in the side um this is a canon canon dslr so this is a two and a half mil jack plug and this is actually just a standard av lead that you can buy on ebay for very little and if you short the center of the yellow and white together that triggers the shutter you can buy two and a half mil plugs, it's just that they're uh, a bit fiddly to wire up and uh, it's just as easy as to buy a really terminated lead. I just shave the corner off of this just to make it fit in the um, in the socket because there's a ridge on the side of the connector. And this is a, a basically it's a 3.3 volt um, logic input and so there's a, there's a weak 3.3 volt supply so you short, yeah, you short it to ground and it uh, fires the trigger. So that's fairly easy to interface to because you don't want to stick any high voltages or anything in there. And I rigged up this shelf attached to the bench because one thing I was finding when I was um, just had the tripod on the floor, this floor flexed enough that if you walk past it, you'll move the camera position slightly. So I just uh, made a, a separate shelf to make it uh, reasonably well mechanically isolated because I'm uh, using a fairly small fraction of the uh, frame just because the, uh, the distance to where the camera is, a very small movement of the camera becomes quite noticeable on the um, final image. Now I didn't really want to mess around writing software for this so um, I decided to sort of see if I could do it using just the standard CAM process. I use uh, Cut2D for generating toolpaths which is a fairly simple bit of software but it does what I need and it does it reasonably well. So the first thing I started off with was a simple pocket toolpath like this. So this um, obviously we'll just sort of cut out the area then lift the tool and then starts again. Now obviously what I wanted to do was automatically trigger the camera. So this simple pocket method that provided a fairly simple way of doing it because at the end of each pass it lifts, you know, it lifts and then moves to the, um, the start point and then drops again. I can actually use the direction line of the output driving the z-axis stepper motor so this basically will go high when it lifts and goes low when it drops or the other way around depending on how the system's set up so this could actually be fed directly to the camera trigger and this worked but there were two problems with this firstly I was occasionally getting additional direction pulses I think I don't know if it was rounding errors or just some permutation there were certain combinations where it would generate multiple direction pulse because of course the, the the direction pulse doesn't matter when it's not not actually stepping so it may be something to do with the um, the firmware in the TNT controller was doing that. Another problem was that with the Canon camera certainly if that shutter contact is closed it doesn't produce the preview image until that contact opens so you know you, you close it it takes the photo but it will then wait until that contact release is released before showing the preview image so that was a bit, bit annoying and you can actually Get, a, get around that by you start messing around using capacitors to control the pulse width and so on but that, that, that was all a bit bit of a mess. The other issue was that I wanted to actually make the um, the tool actually clear away from the pocket before taking the photo so you don't actually get the um, the tool in shot. So um, the way I got around that was fairly simple I took the g-code that came out of the, um, the cam tool and just 
because I knew there would always be a code in there to lift up to a position. I, I set the um, the height to half a millimetre above the surface, obviously to avoid wasting time going up. So at the end of every path, it would always produce this G0, uh, 0 0.5 command to lift the tool. So what I could then do was just use a, um, a bulk search and, search and replace to change that to a lift, then move away, take the photo, move back again. So that looked like, like this, so it cuts the section, moves out the way, takes the photo, moves back in again, etc. Now obviously I couldn't use the step, the um, Z-axis direction line to trigger the camera because that would trigger here, whereas obviously I want it to trigger when it's moved over here out the way. What I could do, the, um, the CNC controller has got facility for controlling lubricant uh, dispensing. I can basically, by using these the um, MIST M07 code, I can get it to control an output pin on the controller. And in fact, that output pin is, a, is a, an optimized slater output, which is effectively like a contact closure. So I could connect that MIST control output of the CNC directly to that shutter cable. There's no electronics at all involved and just edit the g-code so once I, I, I add the commands to, to move over to the position I then just add, add the MO7 to trigger the camera and then there's an MO9 to release the trigger playing around with this if I just did MO7 MO9 it would actually produce either no pulse or a pulse that was too short to trigger the camera now you can actually add a timer to this but unfortunately um, the minimum resolution is one second so the, the slowest I could do it would you know, move across and then hold the camera shutter for one second which is a bit of a waste of time so what I did was I just uh, moved, you know, moved, did the MO7 to turn it on then did a very small move and then did the command to turn it off and that small move was long enough to um, provide the, a, a long enough trigger pulse but without it hanging around waiting so that looked like like this so it cuts the section moves out the way, takes the photo, moves back in again etc now one issue here is these are almost certainly not the right tools to use. Um, these are sort of basically designed as general purpose routers sort of for side cutting and effectively all the load because I've been cutting very small sections, typically 0.01 millimetre per pass. Pretty much all the load is being focused on that tip. So you can see this is a, um, an unused tool on the left, but this one on the right, yeah, just one, one sort of um, three millimeter pocket has just taken quite a substantial chunk out of this and you could actually see that it was tending to tear the copper off rather than actually cutting through it. Yeah, there's almost certainly a better tool that's actually designed for face cutting that you should probably use when you're doing this rather than these end cutting, but these are just what I happen to have, have um, handy. Obviously fiber glass is quite a bad, yeah, tough material because it's, yeah, it's got heavy glass filling so you're basically cutting through glass which, yeah, wears out tools quite rapidly anyway.